Sepp Blatter once said that the ancient sport of Cujo is the oldest form of football in existence. As we all know, Sepp Blatter is the man of utmost honesty and integrity. So this warrants a closer look. Cujo was played around 2,400 years ago in China and its rules were formalised around 200 years later. There were two teams on a marked pitch with two goals and handling the ball and rough tackling was allowed. It was most likely played mostly in the army for training and as a form of recreation. Cujo eventually died around about 2,000 years later. But not before influencing other countries. In Malaysia there was Sepat Raga. The Japanese played a game called Kamari, which they claim was even earlier than Cujo. But there's nothing to support this and the only conclusion we can draw is that they're big fat liars. What we do know about Kamari is that it was mainly ceremonial and the object of the game was to keep the ball in the air as long as possible. Like a really early and shit version of the long ball and they used trees to bounce the ball off and stuff. And a game called Marn Grook in Australia eventually became Aussie Rules Football and is likely older than Cujo. But as we all know Aussie Rules Football isn't a proper sport anyway. Other games existed around the world, but it's quite telling that the Romans had the Colosseum, a 50,000 capacity arena, the biggest stadium in the world for many years, and never bothered playing ball games there, which is similar to the Etihad, with both being empty for ball games. But what the Colosseum maybe did give us was the first derby, where the green and blue chariot teams and their fans faced off, and probably kicked shit out of each other like fans do today. The Romans also played a game called Harpastum, which was a game they stole from the Greeks. In Harpastum, the Romans divided themselves into four lines, essentially becoming the first formation, and those lines would eventually become attack, midfield, defence and goalie. There was no mention of a libero or a Romdoita, but it was a start. Not that football was welcomed by all. The game was banished in Spain and English kings banned it in favour of people practising archery. Football was either restricted or divided by the elite, that is until the mid 1800s. Around this time football exploded at public schools in England due to the teachers wanting to give the boys a focus other than fighting. I'm not joking, there were times when the army was called into schools. Admissions were also falling and team sports were considered the answer. Rules were developed in individual schools which caused confusion when schools played each other. Some, such as Harrow, had a kicking game. Others, such as rugby, were allowed to handle the ball and hack down opponents. There were even cases of football matches being played in the first half and rugby in the second. Speaking of which, rugby school was the first to produce a written set of rules in 1845. A solution to the different rules problem was needed and schools tried to resolve this in 1846 with a set of compromise rules in Cambridge without much success. Then in 1863 many of these early teams met in the only place where all great ideas are born, the pub. They discussed a set of unified rules and these would become the first FA. Not that the FA made any difference, schools ignored their rules and played how they wanted to anyway, a bit like my kids, never listen. In 1871, the London and Sheffield FAs came up with a solution to establish a compromised set of rules that took out all the worst parts and created the Rugby Football Union. Football was finally its own thing, but was still considered a pastime, not a sport. I mean, who'd be interested in taking this up as a sport? Well, this lot. But to get to this point, football needed a visionary. Step forward, Charles Alcock. Charlie Boy was a pupil at Harrow and was instrumental in starting the FA when he left. He pioneered the FA Cup which started in 1871 and is the world's oldest football tournament. So in 1871 the Football Association Challenge Cup aka the FA Cup was born. 50 clubs were eligible but only 15 took part due to the travel and costs. Wanderers won the final with the goal for Morton Betts who was playing under the fake name A.H. Checker as he'd already played for Harrow Checkers in the tournament. Honestly you couldn't make it up, it's the equivalent of helping your mate's Sunday league team because they're a player short but then winning the FA Cup at the end of it, mental. Lord Kinnard played in the early FA Cups and is considered to be football's first star and he became one of the first presidents of the FA. To this day he holds the record for the most FA Cup final appearances with nine, winning it five times which was a record which stood until 2010 when Ashley Cole broke it, just like he broke his Arsenal contract and then Cheryl's heart. In the following year, the first international was played between England and Scotland, it was shite. 4,000 fans crammed into Hamilton Crescent, which is now a cricket ground, to watch a boring 0-0 draw. But that's not surprising, there were no previous examples for them to draw on and the result was a mess, with players wearing different coloured shirts with teams only being identifiable from the hats they were wearing. Despite being as boring as an Everton match, it was the most important football match in history. This match was the first example of two cultures clashing, England's dribbling game versus Scotland's passing game. 
The Scottish team Queen's Park pioneered a passing game, but the English dismissed their style because we're stubborn snobs who think we know best. The Scottish can even claim to have the first ever football club when the imaginatively named The Football Club was formed in 1824, although it only lasted 17 years and they didn't really play a sport that resembled anything like modern football anyway. A bit like Southampton. In 1857, Sheffield FC was formed and FIFA recognises them as the oldest football team in the world who are still active, and we all trust FIFA's judgement. In the late 1800s, the spread of the railways allowed the game to expand. Football fed off the growth of this industry. Teams began to form from the working class. Manchester Railway was formed, which eventually became Man United, and workers of Woolwich Arsenal formed, well, Arsenal, obviously. And as fan bases grew, clubs were forced to find permanent homes, and the world's first football match was played in 1860 at Sandygate, which is the oldest football stadium in the world. The 1883 FA Cup marked a real power shift in football and the birth of modern football as we know it. It was the first tournament that was won by a working class team when Blackburn Olympic won it to start a new era in the sport, which means that despite Blackburn Olympic only existing for 11 years, they've won the same amount of FA Cups as Leeds United. As clubs sought to dominate, they started to look further afield for new players and to attract new talent in the days before oil money, teams started to pay players. The FA were against professionalism but eventually gave up and in 1885 allowed it, props due to a load of teams threatening to leave. Just a few years later the first pay transfer happened when Jack Southworth moved from Blackburn to Everton for 400 quid, roughly 41 grand today, equivalent to how much Ivan Tony spends each week on bets. In 1888 one of the Aston Villa directors, William McGregor, initiated a meeting to discuss a new league, a bit like the Premier League but without all the greedy dickheads in charge. There were 12 teams and it wasn't hugely successful to begin with, although the same can't be said about Preston North End who became the first league champions in the world and won the title without losing a single game. Football's first Invincibles achieved it in football's first ever season. Over these decades the rules and pitch changed loads of times, almost as many times as John Burridge changed clubs. Football started to expand across Europe with working men abroad who took footballs with them to work, which makes me wonder just how much work they did, but anyway. It expanded except in Germany, it were completely xenophobic and regarded football with suspicion only because it was a British import. Anyway, at this point gymnastics was the national sport in Deutschland and football was seen as indecent due to the shorts. Genuinely, a country that killed millions of innocent people considered shorts to be that one step too far. Couldn't make it up. It also expanded further than Europe. In India, priests used to teach boys football in the 1870s as a way of convincing them to attend church. And the Argentine Primera Division became the first league outside the UK in 1891 and other countries quickly followed. As football expanded, the sport needed an organisation to rule over everyone and completely f*** things up now and again, so FIFA was founded in 1904. Other competitions began to expand. Great Britain became the first official world champions when winning the 1908 Olympics, so yo FIFA, we want our other star. Many tournaments came and went, such as the Vienna Cup, which FIFA recognises as the first European trophy in 1914, the Mitropa Cup in 1927 and many others. At the same time the International Cup was born which was essentially an early version of the Euros with Italy becoming the first European champions. The tournaments were known for lasting ages with the first tournament lasting three years, almost as long as a Paul Pogba run up. But the International Cup wasn't very international with only five teams taking part but it was a start and transformed into the Euros that we know today. Berns Ross became the first treble winners and Austria became the first country outside of Britain to accept professionalism in 1920. Other countries followed suit and by 1931 European teams became as good as the British, which sounds ridiculous now but remember England were the world's top team before the war, it's just the 80 years since that we've sucked. Around this time the Austrian Runder team emerged led by the excellent Matthias Sindelar, a man who spoke out against the Germans and mysteriously ended up dead at 35, but remember it's the shorts that are the problem. Around this period in 1929 Mussolini recognised the importance of sport in politics and the Serie A as we know it today kicked off the same year. Around this same time a man known as Jules Rimet was the FIFA president, one of the decent ones, and he proposed the World Cup which was first held in 1930. It was held in Uruguay mostly because it was the anniversary of their independence, but also because Uruguay offered to pay all travel costs, and as we all know FIFA can't turn down offers of cash. The next two World Cups were literally bought by Mussolini and it continued to grow, from 13 teams under Rimet to a worldwide spectacle with 48 teams in 2026. Regardless of how they achieved it, this makes Vittorio Pozzo the only manager to have won two World Cups, which was also either side of the 1936 Olympics, which they also bought at one. In these times, tactics continued to develop. Herbert Chapman was the Huddersfield manager and moved to Arsenal to great success. He's believed to be the first man to use a third man in defence. The 50s saw the birth of the big one. For the Champions League, the biggest and best club competition of the ball. 
Real Madrid won the first five competitions, but they've only won it nine times since. As time went on, the great Hungary team emerged in the 50s, which were based on the great Onved team. The players were given the freedom to experiment and basically do what they liked, which is the first real version of total football, where every player could play effectively in every position. What's interesting is that the great Austrian-Hungary teams had their foundations laid by an Englishman. Jimmy Hogan was a pioneer and the reason why tactics evolved and power shifted. He helped coach those great teams or players and he's maybe even responsible for those thrashings by Hungary in the 50s, the traitor. The following decade came another pioneer, Viktor Maslov. Who the f is that guy? A Russian manager who first pioneered the 4-4-2 formation, the first to consider player nutrition and possibly the first manager to invent a pressing game. Russia went on to win the first Euros in 1960, maybe helped by Russian teams adopting his style. Talking of which, the first ever match in the Euros is still its highest scoring match to this day. This decade also brought us the introduction of cards, which were invented by an English referee and was an idea he had after stopping his car at some traffic lights. In the 60s and 70s we saw this guy. Venus Mikkels and his excellent Ajax team played a version of total football and the national team took this idea and became one of the top teams of the decade, winning the Euros in 88 with a fluky goal by Van Basten. The 1970 World Cup was also the first World Cup where cards were used, but nobody really cared about cards as Brazil smashed Italy in the final. The 80s started with Serie A lifting a ban on foreign players leading to an influx of foreigners and the league being perhaps the best in Europe in the 90s and some great memories for me as I watched Football Italia in the 90s. The 70s and 80s also brought increased stadium standards following some tragedies such as the disasters at Eisel, Hillsborough, Valley Parade, Ibrox and one of the worst of them all, the Estadio Nacional disaster in Peru in 64. Stadiums started being upgraded and repaired and thankfully such disasters are much less common now. The 90s then brought us the Bosman ruling. Belgian midfielder Jean-Marc Bosman may have appeared in court in 2011 for assaulting a 15 year old girl like a big man but it was his first court appearance in the early 90s that challenged transfer rules and led to greater control over contracts by players. This was a landmark ruling which changed the landscape of football, which makes it more sad that the court process left him bankrupt and he was relying on handouts from FIFA Pro just to survive. But I'm sure FIFA will help him out. Also in the 90s was the advent of the Premier League, a way for Sky's greedy fat cats to con the average fan out of the game by overcharging for TV packages, although it can be argued that the money has been invested in other areas to improve the sport. And in the years since we've had the Messi-Ronaldo rivalry elevating each other to higher levels, resulting in five Ballon d'Or wins for Ronaldo and seven for Messi. Nobody else has ever won more than three, so their achievements deserve a mention. Ronaldo has gone on to set the records for the most amount of caps as well as goals. And don't involve me on any debates on who's better. It's pathetic and childish. It's messy. Not much has evolved in the years since, so that pretty much brings us to today. Goal line technology was permitted from 2012 and works quite well, and would have prevented this farce. And VAR was introduced in 2018, which works, um, not so well. Simply put, football went global due to its simplicity. You just needed some space, a ball made from anything, and the worst player to go in goal. Even Captain Scott took a ball with him on an expedition to the South Pole in 1910, so I guess that means he played for South Poland? I'll get my coat. Thanks for watching if you made it this far. What have I left out? Let me know in the comments. In the meantime, you might like these videos shown on screen now, or who knows, you might hate them. But thanks again for watching, and see you soon.